Now, I'm going to LinkedIn because I don't have to actually have a, a bio on uh, Bruce Wood, but I think this is covered enough of it. Um, Bruce Wood specializes in creation science apologetics. He's worked at ICR for years. He's had first-hand uh, close associations with Wayne Gish, Henry Morris, Donald DeYoung, name the biggest names in creation science, he's rough shoulder. And he is an apologetic specialist, he's an educator. Um, it's really a privilege to have him come out tonight. Where is he? <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> well, and uh, again, uh, tonight he will be speaking to us on scientific dominoes from a transcendent God. Let's welcome Bruce Woods. Thank you. Thank you. It truly is a privilege to be with you tonight. 42 years ago, I wouldn't be able to say that because I was not a Christian. And I was a devotee of evolution for 26 years. I'm, I'm 67 years old now. And uh, if that's the White House, I'll take it later. <laughs> Reagan's a good buddy of mine. No, I mean, uh, I should have said Turk. Anyway, I... Uh, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in the ripe old age of 26 after four years of the Air Force and uh, two years on professional ski patrol at Mammoth Mountain, not that far from here. And uh, I, I got saved down in Grossmont College um, in San Diego, and I had two problems, the deity of Christ and evolution of creation. And after a year, I uh, found about 150 years on the deity of Jesus Christ, problem solved there. And it took me a good two years to realize, not being a science, I'm not a scientist, I don't want to fake you out with that, um, but two years of good study, tutelage, under Gish and, and the Morrises and the rest of them down there convinced me that evolution doesn't have any scientific uh, facts to back it up. And so I got on board with the Institute for Creation Research, or ICR, for nine and a half years. Then I was uh, he hoed with nine others with a crunch of the monetary financial problem there and uh, went up north and eventually went into retirement and then started up my own ministry, uh, Theologue Creation Ministries. I do believe I have enough of these brochures on the back. Well, it's not a brochure, it's a track. And if you like them, you can re print them off of my website. I have my website in the back of this. Uh, there's a blank space. My pastor, I, I attend, uh, I'm a member of Grace Baptist Church in Redding, California. That's where, I, that's where I'm from. That's where my home is. And it has my uh, website here. So take a look at that. You'll find some interesting things. On the front, uh, front page, you'll see directives to uh, dinosaurs. I have a lot of stuff on dinosaurs. I also have a, a button you can punch or push or whatever to get to my 20-page uh, um, document on um, the, uh, well, it's an apologetic paper. I call it the Grand Apologetic, and there's a link to it, and it took me about uh, 15 years to put all that together. So it'll give you about every basic knowledge item that you want to know about evolution and creation and theology. I do have a Master's in Theological Studies from Northwest Baptist, Study, uh, Baptist Seminary, and so I've combined the two, the science that I know and the uh, theology that I know, and put together uh, what you see on my website. So I uh, was recently with uh, Shasta Bible College up in Redding, California, a very fine school, Shasta Bible College and graduate school. You can just go to shastabiblecollege.org uh, on the website. If you want great theology, your kids will not get better theological training than there. May not be a massive school like uh, some of the big ones, but there's none better that I know of that will teach a good dose of theology to your children. And don't they need that today? Hmm? Um, so I also would be amiss if I didn't say hello to uh, those who have helped me get here in the first place. Anita Covey and John Covey. Uh, they got me introduced here and, and helped me get in place on the speaking uh, program with you. Anita uh, is helping me to edit a novel that I finished a little while ago. I'd call it a Christian apologetic spy mystery thriller adventure. 
It's, uh, it's only 492 pages long. So she, she's helped me edit. She's up to page 350. I'm up to page 250, something like that. So I'm a little behind there. But it's, uh, it'll be a wondrous uh, study, if not film, if it ever gets completed, probably about 20 more years at the rate we're going. Uh, so hello, Anita and John. Thank you for getting me here. Tonight's presentation is something I, I came up with uh, several years ago uh, when I was going through Genesis account once again. And I started thinking about, well, what did the effects of the Genesis flood do? I started linking one thing after another. I came up with the program you're here to see tonight. I hope you will enjoy it. And again, don't forget those um, tracks in the back. I think you'll enjoy those. I, by the way, I developed those tracks uh, as a bicycle ministry when I was down in San Diego. I developed that. I'd write, I, had, uh, I, I rode 40 to 60 miles every week for about 10 years. And coming back, I came by the beach quite a bit, uh, Ocean Beach, no, 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 Pacific Beach on the boardwalk. And during the sun, when it was going down, I saw just hundreds of people sitting on the three foot high uh, block wall just looking the sun go down. I was wondering, what are they thinking about? And so I came up with this track, the basics of it, it has evolved uh, over the years. Uh, so it can be used for any old thing, any old place, any old person. So I gave two of them out. Uh, one to a homeless person on the way down here and another one, another homeless person. <laughs> and so uh, I hope you'll enjoy what you read. Well, this began at the beginning here and I click the go button. And I've named this thing scientific dominoes from a transcendent uh, God. It's one of my favorite words. And you don't see the word transcendent in the Bible, but you do know that God is transcendent. He can intervene in time and space anytime he wants to. He's the Alpha Omega. He can see the beginning from the end. And uh, I got a half hour, is that right? Oh, well. Just shoot me when I go over time here. In Christian love, of course, please. And he sees the beginning from the end or any time in between right now. And so we need to see how he interfered and interfer uh, inter influenced history. Uh, especially during and after the Genesis flood. I, I call these event changing scientific dominoes because one thing led to the other. It pushed another thing over from the Genesis flood, which is the primary domino, domino it uh, influenced what happened thereafter. Primary is a Noahic flood. And so when you see little dominoes and in the inset there, they say that here's another domino that was triggered by the flood. Evidence against the local flood. Now, when I gave tours for 16 years in the uh, ICR Creation Museum in San Diego, which is still there, by the way, it's been expanded uh, from four to 10,000 square feet. And it's still there. I think the charge is like uh, seven bucks a head for the adult. It's, it's so good, you gotta go through that. But I gave roughly a little over 3,000 tours of the average uh, size of the people, about 10, 15, okay? I've had them as big as 60 and as little as one. I love giving tours to that museum, and the average tour is about an hour and a half. But a lot of those people, most of them were Christians, bona fide going to heaven, seeing they're Christians. But a lot of them were really confused about creation and evolution. And many, many, many of those uh, Christians believe that God used some kind of evolution. And if I don't say it now, I know I say it in my uh, dinosaur presentation, I'll give a presentation, creation presentation on dinosaurs of all places at Disneyland uh, next, next Wednesday. They have a prayer club. It's the oldest and most official club there. It's from the beginning of Disneyland. And so I've invited to give a creation presentation on Dinosaur Theology 101. Meanwhile, back in the tours I gave, I noticed that a lot of Christians were very fuzzy as to if God used evolution. That was one of the main questions I got. Did God use evolution? I'll show you why he could not have done that later on. Local uh, uh, evidence against the flood were all animals and humans in the Mesopotamian Valley. Uh, that was a big thing for a while now. And back in 1999, National Geographic did a thing. Well, they found the local flood of Noah's day, you see. And it encompassed uh, quite a bit of area. And uh, if you go to National Ge Geographic uh, magazine, punch in Noahic flood, you'll probably get that article. But I use that in another part or another presentation. And uh, so they've got it there, but it was only local. Uh, if you know of Hugh Ross, he's in the area here. I've listened to him about five live hours worth. 
And he said it was a local flood. And he said, uh, one question was asked, well, did he, uh, you're talking 100,000 years of, of, of mankind being there. Are you thinking they didn't overswell the territory? And no, he said there were mass murders that kept the population down. You see, so it was just a local flood. I don't think so. That just doesn't work with me, okay? It took 100 years to build the ark. Noah started building that ark at 500 years of age. He ended at 600, 100 years to build that ark. Have you ever imagined your way through reading a Genesis flood account? A hundred years of building that ark. Um, I'd like to get into that more. I don't. I have another talk on that. A hundred years to build the ark. A local flood? In a hundred years, he could have motor, motored every animal he wanted out of that area. It was just a local flood. Why were birds aboard? If it was just a local flood, why did he want two of every kind of bird on the ark? They could have, in a sense, flown the coop in a hundred years. Okay, the first sign of rain, they're out of there. Okay, they're out of Dodge. So it just doesn't work for being a local flood. The Bible says, all those in whose nostrils was the breath of spirit of life, all that was on dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the earth, uh, the ground, uh, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the year. Notice if you will, no less than three times, you have the word all. In the original Hebrew, the word means all, okay? It means everything. Everything that had the breath of life in it was gone. It was drowned. I think God knows what he was talking about. Dr. Henry Morris, the founder of ICR, did a wonderful and elaborate job of saying how the flood level rose until it covered the highest mountain, which is not that high in that day, and the highest one being about five or 6,000 feet high. But if you uh, smoothed out all the land area of Earth, you'd have 8,000 feet above the Earth of that land mass. Uh, so that, God, God took out everything. Now, another domino cause was a paleontology domino, or the fossil record of sorts. Now, when I was a kid, fossils bored me to death, okay? And they might bore you to death, but there's so many interesting facts. Uh, the previous pastor to the church I go to, Grace Baptist Church, he was a master in fossil uh, geology and fossilized uh, material. I just blanked. Um, but he's got world-class fossils in cases when you enter into the church up there. Uh, the, the display cases full of these fossils. He's had people from Japan and uh, Europe come and look at these things. They're, they're that good. And they have a lot of tales to tell about age and how they became fossils and so forth. Noahic flood eliminated geological ages. That is, the majority of fossils uh, were made during the flood. I'm sure you know that by now, but a lot of Christians don't know this information. They don't know the basic. They look, look at the Grand Canyon. I've been there about five or six times, and you look at all the uh, strata there, and people are thinking, oh, it took millions and millions of years. And Dr. Steve Austin said, no, it took uh, less than a couple of weeks to form that. I'll get to that later. I'm ahead of myself here. Dr. John Morris, current president of ICR, says this, much less than 1% of all fossils are land animals, and 1%, less than 1% of that are dinosaurs. And so there are not that many dinosaurs. Yeah, there are thousands and thousands of dinosaurs, but they are destroyed. I mean, they're just wrapped up, smashed up, put down, and then quickly covered by a certain sediment layer to, to preserve them that way. It's so rare it is to find a complete structured dinosaur anywhere where you do find them, they're just scattered all over the place. Dinosaurs were buried in the wake, uh, flood sediments, and it took a very uh, specific kind of sediment to encapsulate the creature, dinosaur or whatever, uh, to prevent it from getting eaten or bacteria or, or excessive uh, air or, or water to leach out that stuff. And so that this guy here became this guy here. And all these kids are being paraded in the Los Angeles Natural History Museum. What's the first thing they want to see? Dinosaurs, okay? And so what they're looking at is something that was really caused, the death of which was caused by the flood. Now this guy over here, he could have been living hundreds and hundreds of years, just like Adam and Eve, because they could have been preserved in their, before the flood. 
with perfect sediment, perfect food, uh, protective canopy above from the sun and other harsh uh, cosmic rays. And so there's no reason why dinosaurs and other animals could, have lived, could not have lived for hundreds of years as well. So this guy could have been li uh, living for hundreds of years. But these kids being paraded by are being told this guy conked out 65 million years ago. No, this guy is only thousands of years old, not millions. Another domino uh, that was caused by the flood is natural resources. In this case, uh, coal beds and oil preserves. Uh, there's a lot of coal all over the world, and many people were stymied. The best of the best geologists, they couldn't figure out how coal was formed. How did the coal layers form? Okay, well, we see these coal layers in um, Alaska, and you see the dark coal layers, the seams, uh, interspersed with uh, uh, stuff laid down by the sediment, by the ocean waters, uh, different layers here and there, a lot of that in Kentucky, Kentucky and so forth. And so a fellow by the name of Dr. Steve Austin, not the $6 million man Steve Austin, some of us old moldy goldies can relate to that. And uh, he, was, he was my professor a couple of times at Christian Heritage College. He's one of the best, most dynamic geologists I've ever come across. <coughs> He has discovered over 10 billion uh, fossilized uh, structures, long fossils, spiroidal fossils, I can't think. Nautiloid, thank you. Uh, in the Grand Canyon, on the side canyon of the Grand Canyon. The park rangers had known of a few of them in existence, but his discovery launched the incredible, um, they had over 10 billion, they figured, in a massive grave in that area and 60% were angled so that they were pushing or struggling against some kind of a current, you think. Um, I'll get to him later on, but he discovered some miraculous things, not miraculous, but incredible things. And so he, I, I took his class back in 1979. He was doing his uh, doctorate on uh, geology, on fossilization, and he said, don't breathe the word of this to anybody because I haven't submitted my my doctrinal studies, my thesis yet, you see. And so he came up with what he called a model proposed by Dr. Steve Austin called bathtub theology. And so he was uh, sitting in the bathtub one night, he saw the suds, the soap suds pushed up against the side, but they tapered out and they went to the middle. And he started thinking about that and he thought, well, maybe the flood, when the uh, continent started to rise again, all the logs and debris and everything else was pushing up against these rising continents. You see, and then it tapered out as they went further into the uh, sea, you see. And so he uh, thought about that, so he did his thesis on that, and this is what he came up with basically. We have the uh, floating mats, hundreds and hundreds of miles wide and long, and they bump into the continent, and a lot of stuff is deposited down below, which is called peat. Your beginning uh, seam of uh, coal, you see. And then the wind current would push it out and back and out and back, and these are different places all over the world. And so eventually, it would lay down these, these uh, forms, and then in between, their way out to sea, other sediment layers would push down upon them, causing coal to form, you see. And then you have these layers that are, that are made up uh, during that year's time. And so what happened later was, we have a thing called Mount St. Helens, uh, this thing erupted uh, two weeks before I went to seminary in Tacoma, Washington there. And it went from that pristine beauty to this in less than 24 hours. Incredible. I've been up there, like I say, about four or five times as well as Grand Canyon. And if you notice here, in Spirit Lake, which is pushed up a hundred, couple hundred feet higher, two-thirds two of the size greater, and you notice something, all those logs are barren. No branches. No limbs, uh, same thing, no bark. And so Dr. Steve Austin started thinking about that. Now this is eight weeks after they gave him his doctorate, okay, at a little known school called Penn State. When he proposed his idea that coal was formed because of the Noahic flood, he told us in the classroom, they said to him, we think you're an idiot, go ahead and try and prove it. And so he defended his oral thesis so well, they said, well, we still think you're an idiot, but here's your doctorate, okay. <laughs> So eight, uh, eight months later, Mount St. Helens went kablooey. And so he did, he's been up there at least 400 times studying this area, you see. And he and his buddy looked at all these logs and said, look at this, where, where'd all the bark go? 
because in most coal seams, you have a lot of bark in that coal. So they got on scuba deer. This is about three months after the initial blast off with the Mount St. Helens, taking their lives in their hand, yes? And so they, uh, they went submerging and went to the bottom and they discovered three to four feet of peat made up with all the shredded uh, bark coming off the trees. And when, when that blast clobbered the trees, it just shredded them and just took off the bark and, and just crunched it up and threw it down into the newly formed Spirit Lake. And so this is what they found. Now if another St. Helens occurrence took place and uh, a heavy layer of sediment pushed down on that to the point of, of great stress, you'd have a, another coal seam that would be made in Mount St. Helens. And as far as natural uh, oil reserves and gas reserves, uh, God made sure that phenomenal amounts of natural gas and oil were preserved underneath these capstones, cap rocks, hard enough to keep them from leaching out of the, the uh, gas as well as the oil. And so had that not been there, then all the oil would have dispersed into the ocean and we wouldn't be able to motor our cars, okay? Well, another domino was called geography. And I think, to my knowledge, both uh, natural geologists and Christian geologists agree that there was one land mass called Pangaea, and it eventually broke up. And yet, when I was in grade school, I was taught in this thing called a continental drift, okay? Well, ICR uh, disagrees with that. They think that it was a continental sprint, okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, those continents separated so fast, they estimate, they just came out with a four video uh, on the earth and so forth, and a geology uh, video they had, they believe it was like five feet per hour, okay? That they were separating five feet an hour. That is 200 miles in one week. So what city are we in right now? Huh? LA City. Let's say LA, okay? If, if, if LA was on one continent and San Diego was on another continent, in one week we'd be 200 miles apart. Okay, that's how fast that stuff separated, okay? Well, we come to another domino that was caused by Noah's flood. We call this, this this race issue, and isn't that incredibly strong in this America that we live in, okay? This race issue. We need to discuss that, and we need to, I just received five uh, video, um, DVDs I ordered from a company that, that stresses the importance of the blacks in America. And I, wanna, I want to get a couple of primary um, black pastors, I want to bring them to lunch, and from there I want us to discuss how we can introduce the truth about how blacks got their coloration. Uh, to, in churches and schools and so forth. I, I have a real burden for that. And so what happened was that when they got off the ark, they went to different areas, and a lot of these areas were cold or warm. You can see the temperate climates. Some are very hot with a tremendous amount of sun. Some are very cold, not too much sun, like in Alaska. And so we have this thing called the Punat Square where if you have Adam and Eve, they have the combinations available, all the genetic information needed to, to go dark skin or black, uh, white light skin, okay? So if you have two blacks getting together, you're gonna produce all dark skin. Same thing with light skin, so you see. What happened was before the flood, you have the ability to manufacture more or less what we call melanin. Now we have enough of that so we can get a nice golden tan in the sun, or crispy burn to a crisp if uh, you're out there too long, if you're a white folk like me, all right? Uh, even blacks get uh, sunburn. But before the flood, they had a phenomenal amount to increase substantially or decrease substantial amounts of melanin. So if they went to Alaska, where you needed light skin to absorb as much sun as you can, then you depleted your melanin supply, you became light skin. Same thing if you're in Africa or some place that has a lot of sun. You want to build up your melanin layer to reflect or deflect the sun off of that. But after a while, you get locked into that. Uh, after generations, you lose the ability to produce or, or uh, reduce or increase the amount of melanin. You lose it. 
And so what you have are different tonations of skin color, and you're locked into that. But the thing is, and the truth of this, there are so many varieties, uh, yet so many genetic combinations, and that's all it amounts to, genes, genetics. And now if you have not today, we have a lot of uh, dark-skinned folk marrying light-skinned folk, and you have the com combined genetics, and you have the in-between tonation of skin color there, you see. So I, we see that more and more prevalent today. And so what we end up having is just one race. It's called the human race, you see? And we've got to stress that far and near, make that very absolutely clear to everybody. My good friend, Frank Sherwin, who is still a very good biologist down at the Institute for Creation Research, he was, a, he was a speaker and I went out with him on a number, uh, at least six uh, tours around the country, uh, mostly on the West Coast. He'd do the speaking, I'd do the packing up and selling and taking care of the money and all that good stuff. But we had a riot together. It was one fun time. Uh, and yet, when he comes to the census, uh, when it census is, and he, he, they want him to check off Asian, uh, Filipino, you see all these, Japanese, Korean, he always, always fills in the blank with this word. <laughs> okay, and he's adamant, and if he's ever questioned what she is, he will let them know the truth of it all. You see, he has an opportunity to explain why they're all one race. Okay, I love that. If you want to hear a dumb joke, he's got plenty of dumb jokes for you, okay? We come to another one called climatology, a domino. Uh, before the flood, Nobody had ever seen this stuff. They didn't know what it was. As a matter of fact, Genesis 2.5 says that they need rain. It's just a heavy mist that covered the earth daily. Well, it must have been industrial strength mist because there was a phenomenal amount of foliage on that earth at that time. And so they didn't know what this was. They'd never seen a polar bear. Polar bear came from the bear kind. Polar bears didn't go on the ark. They didn't come off the ark. But because of climatic differences and temperature and so forth, uh, polar bears grew more hair and developed this way and that way. Uh, that is a genetic quality and ability that God put into everything uh, before the flood. They didn't see any polar bears. They didn't see any igloos. They didn't see any polar bears visiting igloos. Eskimos in the igloos, okay? And by the way, did you hear the story about the uh, polar bear who went out to find lunch and an uh, Eskimo who went out to find a fur coat and they both got what they wanted? <laughs> Think about that. And so the question comes up, well, how many ice ages were there? And that's being debated all over the place today, is it not? Well, I've done my own studies on this, though I not be a scientist, which, by the way, is a good thing. I told folks on those tours, I'm not a scientist, but the good news is you don't have to be a scientist. If you just knew the basics of good science and the basics of good theology, you've got them beat. I once had a running debate for three, and a half, three hours and 15 minutes with Dr. William Thwaites down in San Diego. He'd bring students down from San Diego State University from time to time. And I took him on one Saturday morning. We had a running debate for uh, three hours and 15 minutes. And I thought I was gonna get my clock clean. I thought I was gonna mow me down with incredible scientific fact after fact after fact. But you know, in all that time, I did not hear one substantiated scientific fact that backed up evolution. Not one. I was sorely disappointed. Okay, I really was. And yet I'm giving them dump trucks full of information, good science information, that I've gleaned in my years at ICR. They're not one, so sad. Well, ICR has done a lot of research on this, I'm sure you know, and uh, they believe that there are multiple thousands of volcanoes. Did you know there's over 300 volcanoes at the west end of the Grand Canyon alone? And Dr. Steve Austin has uh, documented the fact that he believes that up to seven times the lava flows from those grand uh, volcanoes uh, plugged up the, uh, the river and caused that backwater to go and slough off a lot of that, uh, that dirt that we see there today. Don't see there today. Uh, have you ever built a sand castle in the ocean and you see the waves go against that and it sloughs off? Well, that's what he thought happened to, to form the Grand Canyon further than its initial impact when that, when that dam broke above. I'll get to that in a minute. 
Um, and so with those volcanoes, they're warming up that water, incredible warm temperatures. At the same time, it destroys the, uh, whatever it was that was above the earth, that protecting the earth at the time. And it introduced a phenomenal amount of inclement weather. Very cold air started coming in. Well, you have that meeting the currents of evaporation water, hot water, warm water, I should say, and you collide and you have uh, snow and ice that are produced from on that. And now during that time, you have a lot of solar deflection by a lot of aerosols and dust that are kicked up into the air. And that is deflecting the sunlight from, from keeping it from melting down the snow that is accumulating down below. And that can go on for uh, five to seven hundred years, as a matter of fact. And then you have what's known as the Ice Age, the one and only Ice Age. In my research, I have not come across one credible scientific report that documents how Ice Age, even one, is caused. Nothing out there can cause an Ice Age. The best I read about is Earth going through huge dust storms and causing the sun to be blotted out and cold air. But where is the warm water coming from? And how do you sustain that for hundreds of years? You know, it's got to pass through the dust storm and the sun will come back out and melt whatever's there. So it's not going to last that long in the first place. Well, let's talk about another thing here. Geology, another domino, causes catastrophic formations. And believe it or not, I don't know if I'd say humorous is the right word of choice, but it's interesting to note so many secular scientists, geologists, are coming up with their reports and documentation to consider catastrophe in, in their research, you know? So how did that happen? Well, you have the end of the Ice Age uh, caused by less dust and aerosol layers, lower ocean temperatures, um, so they're, they're colder now. Uh, decreased snowfall, warmer summers, increased snow melt. Well, it got to be the point where it became very, very hot, you see, with an inclement, inclement weather and so forth. You have very hot ages that came across, and so that has a phenomenal melt-off. And you have massive flooding all over the place. I took a tour with ICR once, and we were in one of the three lakes uh, above the Grand Canyon. We are standing in the midst of the Grand Lake that you see there, and it's just incredibly huge. It's immense uh, body of water, dry lake bed, if you will. And they uh, have considered the, uh, the po probability that you have one huge lake really interconnected with three different names given to it. And then at one time, according to Steve Austin, the top of these uh, dams, uh, natural dams, were overwhelmed by water. But at the time, same time, you have a thing called piping going on under the earth. There's a very coarse sediment in that area. And so a lot of water was piping underneath and adding to the destructive force of what was ha going to happen later on. And so when it breached, all three of those lakes uh, went through and formed the Grand Canyon. 277 miles long, 4 to 18 miles wide, and upwards of a mile deep in, in a lot of places there. Uh, and so what you have then is a Noahic flood caused, ice age initiated, catastrophic formation. And it was days in the making, not millions of years. Now it took subsequent months, if not years, for those dams to form from the lava flows, and they overbreached by those um, water currents from the Colorado River, and it would break down, build up, break down, build up, and so forth. But in the meantime, it would uh, push the water back into the Grand Canyon and slough off a lot more of, of that dirt and debris. So it's still very, very non-solid material that was working with back there. We come to the, uh, near the end here, we have God's scientific dominoes. There are others, but I only had time for these. Uh, flood geology, fossil record geology, geography, uh, climatology, and then we have the final one, the big domino that's going to hit in the future. That could take place pretty soon. Well, got to wait seven years for the millennium, and then the millennium. Okay. Uh, when God uh, will cause a new creation, we understand, and the courses I taught, I, I taught uh, courses for seven years at Southern California Bible College down there in Southern California, all right? And most of it was just free, donated time. I actually got paid for one season. <laughs> but we, I told them, okay, kids, we have to understand the facts 
of uh, one of the key questions by young folk today is where did I come from? I just spent a couple of days with my niece and her husband and he's on special force SWAT team uh, with um, activity of going and find the bad guys, you know. But he can fight, he really doesn't know what life is all about. So I answered to my prayer, I had a good time uh, talking to them about the gospel today. And I told them about the uh, beginning where everything was perfect, you see. And then sin really messed up everything. But I stressed the point that Jesus Christ, God incarnate, came to die for all sins, for all people, for all time, never to die again, Romans chapter six. And so that in the future, when all is said and done, he's gonna create a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. And I told them, I stressed the point that you don't know what's gonna to happen to you tomorrow. You're playing a form of Russian roulette. You don't know what chamber that bullet is in that's got your name on it. I told that to the couple of guys I gave some, uh, some money to and on my track to on the way down here. And I said, you're playing games with your own life. You don't realize that. And a lot of them are lost in more than one way, if you know what I mean, okay? And so I stressed to them the importance, and the last thing I said before I left my, my niece and her husband, uh, I stressed this verse here. Uh, I had an interesting time talking to a Jehovah's Witness down in San Diego, a young fellow about 25, I can say young now, but uh, I stressed the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and I said on the doorstep there, you can know that you have eternal life immediately after you die. I did not know his father was standing behind the door listening to all this. He, got, he came out from behind the door, literally stamped his foot on the step and said, nobody can know they can go to heaven immediately after they die. I said, no introduction, no nothing. I said, uh, you can. He said, prove it. Okay, get your Bible. Now I know they use the new, uh, new world translation. I'd never read it, but I'm praying while he's going off to get it. I said, Lord, I hope that verse is in there. <laughs> He came stomping back, and I said, will you please open to 1 John 5, chapter 13, read to me, uh, verse 11 through 13. So, I mean, he was just livid, okay. So he gets there, he says, he sings, no, no, no. And the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life. Eternal life is in his son. He who has a son of God has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. And then he wrote the, uh, read the 13th verse just like this. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may... And he literally stopped. He just stopped cold. I said, what's wrong? He said, I've never seen this before. I said, will you please continue it? That you may know that you have eternal life. Okay? I said, please recognize one thing. Is it up there? On the... Okay. To know and to have is in the Greek present tense. Right now, you can have eternal life right now, okay? If you got whacked by a truck going home or wherever, you instantly you'd be in heaven, okay? He said, I've never seen it before. I said, they don't want you to know this. They want you to continue doing good works and making more money for them, okay? Because they don't ever want you to know that you can go to heaven immediately. Okay, I love that, it's one of my all-time favorite. I use that in just about every evangelistic discussion I've ever had, thousands of them. I always introduce that verse, let it be known, you can know you're going to heaven immediately after you die. Conclusion, we need to know what the facts say, historical, scientific, and theological facts, what they say about our history. Now, we are all looking at it, either through biblical lenses or secular lenses. Uh, we all have the same hardware, okay, our mind, but it's the, but it's the software put into it that counts and our direction of what choices we make in life. I mean, <laughs> let's face it, man. All my education is in the incredible theological distinctive of the Los Angeles public schools, okay? And they just fed me nothing but evolution, okay? The Bible was introduced, but it was mythology. It was fairy tales, you see. I went to a very liberal church. I went every week, but it was a very liberal church. They, they, they stressed that God used evolution. My parents were scientists, but they believed in evolution. What are they supposed to do? Okay, I came, in out, I came out thinking, evolution, what do you think? Okay, so that's what I thought for 26 years until I get whacked upside the head by reality. 
and the perf uh, Jesus Christ and his salvation. Foundation of our thinking is the Bible, but in today's time, uh, theological and uh, kids today are more persuaded by science, yes? Today they had a, well, over 500 parades for science all over the world today, stressing, stressing the importance of good science to back up what? Global warming, all right? And they're in defiance of Trump's idea that that's a bunch of baloney, okay? And, uh, and yet in technological age today, we need to back up what we know in science. I've met a lot, and you've met a lot of people who said, the Bible says it, that's enough for me. Well, that's great, but we need to know this for good apologetics, do we not? And so that's what I, ICR has done, and other very fine creation institutions have documented good, good science by backing up scriptures. Every scientific research project that ICR has developed has been based on scripture. The Noahic Flood, the Genesis account, biology, geology, all the eologies. Uh, and so they're founded on the Bible. Hmm? And so, like I said earlier, basic grounding in science and uh, theology can, can way outweigh whatever they're throwing at us on the evolutionary side. This is my website. You can go to it. If you forget it, that's fine. Just go to Google or whatever and say, Bruce Wood, creation, and you'll get it, okay? It'll take you to my website, and I have two presentations on YouTube. Uh, one is an eclectic one. It's a sampler presentation. It has different uh, slide presentations combined into one. Okay, it's only a half hour long, so you can watch that. And then I have a 55 minute one on Dinosaur Theology 101, if you want to see that too. But I will stress one important thing. I think I've done that already, my 20 or 22 page long grand Grand Apologetic, and it'll take you right there from the home page there. Uh, do that, will you? And so that's the end of our some, uh, scientific dominoes from a transcendent God. I hope you enjoy that. Pick up your brochure or, or your tract at the back there. Okay. We have uh, just a few minutes for questions and answers, and if you have a question, let me have it. They've yeah, already answered everything they ever had. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, what's the name of that uh, theological seminary that you recommended, which is really good, but it's not really big? Oh, yeah. Uh, Shasta Bible College. Shasta Bible. And Graduate School. Shasta Bible College and Graduate. If you go to shasta.edu, uh, you'll find it there. I was there for three years. I was a spokesperson. I went out to schools and churches. One problem with that, you've got to get enough students to keep your job. You know. <laughs> I didn't, and so I didn't. Um, but you'll find no finer school for education in theology. But they stress and they teach uh, good creation as well, good science. As a matter of fact, we just had our 14th annual Alpha Omega Conference. This thing is huge, folks. They had the best of the best speakers. They had the three from ICR. And take a look at that. I, I mean, they are world class from all over the world. Uh, speakers that go to these things. I, for the fourth time I spoke as well. Uh, they usually plant me in a church in the backwoods there. Uh, but I have a delightful time wherever I go, wherever they send me. I will go, here am I, send me, that kind of thing. And so uh, you'll see me on that brochure. I, I think it's still there. Anyway, uh, look them up. And their prices are very reasonable. Okay, um, Very, very uh, affordable. And you can take virtually everything, every course online, okay? And they're not too far, just a hop, skip, and a long jump from here, up in Redding, California, okay? Any other question? Did you say that you taught evolution for 26 years? I didn't teach evolution. I went to evolutionary education at the Los Angeles public school system, okay? I, I did teach a apologetics class based on uh, cre uh, creation at Shasta Bible College. I taught one class in that, and uh, I've taught a number of classes in, in schools, Christian schools, week-long classes at, at several, and uh, I enjoy that very much. I've been, I've, ha I've been allowed to speak in a couple of uh, public schools as well, 
there's a chi Chinese school in San Francisco area. They allowed me to speak one day. Uh, that was a Chinese technological school. My goodness, you said the brain power in this, those, those kids there, you know. I forgot what it was. I think it might have been this particular presentation, but they had about 300 kids there. They were taking notes like they should have. Uh, that was a blast, uh, very good. The, the teacher thanked me, said I did a good job. But that's what we're looking for in good education, is it not? We want to compare this with that, make up our own decision later on. And when the people came in to my, my tours, I often said, I usually did at the beginning, if you came in here believing in evolution or that God used evolution, that has absolutely no bearing on your destiny for eternity. It's what you do with the person and work of Jesus Christ that counts for your eternal salvation. But I often went on to say, if you believe that God used some form of evolution, you do some pretty squirrely things to his, to his character. By the time that hour and a half presentation was done, they understood well, they understood well why God could never have used evolution. Okay. Uh, another question? Yes, sir. Uh, what would you say that uh, you have found in your experience that, that, that you can come against the, uh, uh, like Hugh Ross and all the, I, I just, this not make any sense to me, but I'm, I'm not a scientist or anything like that. But I just found it was just a bunch of bunk, and uh, that's how I described it. I, 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 I sat in those lectures for like six weeks, and I went to listen to the whole thing at the church I went to, and it was just like, I just looked at it, and I just said, it's a bunch of crap. Well, I got a great, theolog great theological word for what he teaches. That theological word is baloney. Okay. Now, after listening to him for several hours, he, he made a dramatic, drastic mistake. He opened it up to question answers. He was absolutely nailed. I mean, upside down and backwards about the Noahic flood, the local flood type of thing. That was bad. And what he did, as a theologian myself, okay, with a master's in that stuff, what he did to theology and science was abominable. Okay, he twisted scripture like you wouldn't believe. I won't get into details, no time. But he had debated ICR scientists several times. They have actually gone to his office and tried to help him see the truth of it all. But I, I, in my heart of hearts, I believe he is saved. But I think he's a very proud man. He counts more on science than he does on theology or the Bible. He says a 67th book is nature. And he gives more credence to nature than he does to what's, what God says about how he made things and when he made them. Okay, and that is very, very poor theology. And he totally messes up how you interpret uh, scripture, especially the days, the days of the creation week. He's way off base on that. And that's his whole premise. Once you mess up on the word day and how to interpret it, you're gonzo as far as the rest of interpretation goes. If we do not know what the word day means and the word, uh, and the word day in Genesis creation week, then how do you interpret any other word in the Bible? You see? I had a question. I had a discussion on that the other day. I said, what about a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day? Have you ever heard that? I got that about every time I gave that presentation in the museum. I said, context, context, context is everything. Look at the context, okay? Uh, Peter, in, in 2 Peter ch uh, chapter 3, verses 3 through 9, is not equating a day to a thousand years. He's saying to God, a day is as a thousand years. He's using similes. And so a day is, to God, could be like a, a million years, a thousand years, okay? Then using my tours, I say, I play games with that. I say, okay, let's say a day is a thousand years. That would mean that Jonah was in the belly of that big fish for 3,000 years, okay? Jesus was in his grave for 3,000 years. I say, well, that's not right. I say, why is it right? If, I can, if you can interpret a day as a thousand years, why can't I, okay? You've got to get to the the basic knowledge of theology and how to study, how to interpret scripture. 
I've come across a pastor who said, if I had it all to do again, the first thing I'd teach him is how to do the basics of interpretation. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. Hmm? Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. Yeah, that big, long theological word that nobody knows. Okay. The science and artificial Yeah. I, I would say that, you know, for five years, I was the go-to person to answer all the questions around the world on theology and creation and evolution and all that. And I'd say, after listening to them, if they knew the Bible and scripture and how to interpret it, they could have answered 75% of the questions I ever got just by knowing what the context was of what they were answering. And that's why it will help you, help your kids, help your grandkids, even your not so grandkids. If they just take a good look at that grand apologetic on my website, they will get an excellent dose of the basic of evolution and creation and science, okay? One last question, I think we got a bail. Anything else? Yes. Uh, yeah, I've always wondered, uh, like with Hugh Ross and a lot of theistic evolution pastors, why they don't uh, understand that God said no one was to add anything to his word or take anything away. And that's what they're doing. They're adding to what he said. And they, I'm joking. I, I, I'm laughing to myself because... They do with their salvation, but they will have to answer to that. that they, they will. Certainly we will. Uh, I was smiling because they interpret the Bible that way. They read into things that are not there. Huh? I was just in my, in my devotion this daily. I was just reading about in, in uh, Mark 14, how the Jews were considering how they could trick Jesus to get him killed. And all the gazillion times I read through that area, it hit me. Why didn't they know scripture? Because they were interpreting scripture their way. They thought they were doing God a favor. And so they were blind to the truth of it all. And that's the problem with so many, even bona fide going to heaven, see them, they're Christians. They are blind because they don't know what they need to know to get them out of the soup they're in, the theological soup. They're saved, but I won't go any further than that. I mean, it's- Full of Jesus. I said, well, I said Jesus, exit Jesus, whatever Jesus you want, but. No, I said Jesus, they're reading into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I said Jesus is what you, what you bring out, that's right. You must be a theologue. <laughs> well, I thank you so much for your time and your consideration of the things that I've said. Uh, take the time to grasp one of those uh, tracks. So it'll have some good information. It'll have my website in the back of that track. With that, I'll give it back to you, sir. Okay, thank you. talking about with the uh, DVDs that we usually sell for five dollars is what we are doing is phasing them out and phasing in YouTube. So we're just downloading, uploading, whatever you want to call it, onto YouTube so everybody can watch these things for free, really. Uh, we've just started a new South Bay Creation Science Association, or is this South Bay Creation? Creation Association. Okay, the whole thing. South Bay Creation Science Association YouTube channel. We've got like three or four on there now, and I've already given them like three more. So every week we'll probably have a couple more to put on. Yours will be on there. And a nice section on Chinese creation science. It'll be really a cool section. And uh, it's just developing. And we also have the original one that uh, Tom Canfield has put together, eight, uh, SCC8. SCCS8. Eight? S-C-C-S-8. It's a mirror. <laughs> Ask him to explain why he did it. Anyway, <laughs> we'll pray for him. Yeah, but there's a lot of videos on that as well. As a matter of fact, I just happened to bump into the fact that we have a human and dinosaur footprint in Tuba City, Arizona uh, video. Uh, Paul Rose now and Jeremy Aldeny showing human and dinosaur footprints just that far apart. It's a theropod dinosaur and a, a moccasin footprint, so it was a good sight. It looked like a cowboy boot, minus the heel. I mean, it was just a typical cowboy boot print, and it was a trackway with a gylophosaur, three-toed theropod dinosaur footprint next to it. 2,500 views in less than a year. I, I wasn't even expecting that. You put it on about a year ago, right? 
I don't know, my, you know, maybe it may have been five years ago for all I know. I think it was about a year or so ago. So I think that is excellent. That means that many times a thing has been viewed. Anyway, so that's where we're going with that. Let's take about 10 minutes and we'll uh, have some refreshments or some tea, coffee, hot chocolate, <laughs> water, and all